Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Jared Labor. I'm a program officer at the Charles Koch Institute, uh, where I work on issues related to both trade policy and foreign policy. Uh, at CKI, we seek to advance a vision of free trade and mutual benefit uh, with the conviction that uh, open markets allow individuals to better realize their full potential and that this process uh, generates widespread and lasting prosperity. But as the title of this week's uh, event signals, uh, U.S. trade policy is at a crossroads. Uh, various developments in the last five to 10 years have shaken loose the foundation of the multiple decades long uh, consensus in U.S. international economic policy of relative free trade and globalization with the COVID-19 global pandemic being the most recent and significant example of that. So over the next couple of days, uh, CKI has assembled uh, an all-star group of experts to parse through all of these issues in order to try to separate the signal from the noise. Uh, on tap today is a panel on the future of US-China economic relations. Uh, starting tomorrow, starting again at 1 p.m. Eastern time, we'll continue with a panel on trade as an underappreciated tool of economic recovery and a debate on national industrial policy. But back to the business of today, let's jump right into our first conversation uh, on the future of US-China relations. Uh, with, with us today is Mary Lovely, who's an economist, uh, a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics here in Washington, D.C., and a professor of economics and Melvin A. Eggers, uh, faculty scholar at Syracuse University's Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. Uh, Scott Kennedy, he is a senior advisor and trustee chair in Chinese business and economics at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and Clark Packard, who's a resident fellow and trade policy counsel at the R Street Institute. Uh, leading the conversation today is Christopher Preble. Uh, Christopher is co-director of the New American Engagement Initiative in the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security uh, at the Atlantic Council. Uh, so the way, so if, uh, the way this is gonna work is Christopher is going to lead a conversation between uh, all these panelists. And uh, if you have questions, uh, feel free to drop those into the Q&A uh, and then we'll try to get some of those uh, towards the end of the session. But with that, I'll turn it over to Chris and our panelists and uh, let's get the conversation going. Great, thanks, Jared. Uh, it's good to be here. It's good to be with such a great group, uh, Mary, Scott and Clark. Um, we only have about 50 minutes and a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to get right into it. I, I know this panel is mostly focused on U.S.-China trade, but I wanted to start with a sort of big picture question about uh, the state of, of global trade today. Uh, how, how would each of you quickly describe where things stand? Uh, later, we'll get into the sort of the particulars of U.S.-China uh, trade, but, I, but I, I just want to try to set up a baseline of, of where things stand right now in terms of the, the present and future of, uh, of global trade. I should go to, let, let's go with Mary first. I'll go in the order that Jared introduced us and then I'll mix it up after that. Mary, you first, please. Well, you know, trade's getting back on track uh, after the pandemic disruption. Um, I think that uh, we see some good signs and some bad signs. A good sign is today we had uh, with the announcement over the overnight of the uh, at least pause, long pause in the U.S. European fight over Airbus Boeing subsidies. Right. Uh, that's a positive. Right. We have some hope that the steel and aluminum tariffs might be removed by the end of the year. I think we're seeing some movement to what I call just not doing stupid, uh, <laughs> you know, hurting each other for really no gain. Um, I know there's a few workers somewhere who will take issue with that, but basically a lot more harm than good on these policies. Uh, the negative side, of course, is that we have to have a bad guy to do this, and that is China. Uh, and we don't hear much really, I think, very realistic uh, talk about how we're going to trade with China. We are waiting for the President Biden's longer review of trade with Asia. Um, I'm a bit fearful that it's going to be one that's basically views trade with China as overwhelmingly negative as opposed to positive. It has very important implications for our trading partners in Asia, many of whom have, um, well, all of whom have important uh, trade relations with China. Uh, a good example would be the Republic of Korea, South Korea, which provides many inputs to China, which then go to the United States. So there are very important um, systemic or network effects involved, and we haven't seen a lot of sophisticated talk out of Washington about how those are going to be managed. 
uh, even if we lay aside the importance of continuing uh, the, the economic development of China itself. So I'll leave it there. Good signs and bad signs. Great. Thanks, Mary. Scott, you want to add to that? Sure. Um, I, I think where we are is in the process of, of answering three questions about uh, globalization. Uh, what happens when the world doesn't all agree with Jared's original analysis about the benefits of globalization? And there's one country in particular which doesn't accept that consensus and doesn't adapt. What do the rest of the, what's the rest of the world do? Then what happens when the benefits from trade aren't evenly shared? How do we adapt? And thirdly, what happens when we find out that even though efficiencies are really, really important, resilience is also really important and how do we adapt? And so I think what we're doing is trying to figure out how to move towards a new globalization 2.0 where we have better answers to those questions than we've had before. I'm actually relatively positive and optimistic that we can come up with good answers. And I think the administration um, so far is giving positive signs, not perfect signs, but uh, I don't think there is any perfect in this world, but a way to try and balance reasonable answers to those three questions. Great, thanks. Clark, how about you? How do you see the state of global trade today? Sure, I, I think we're at a crossroads. I think this uh, event over the next couple of days is, is timely. Um, you know, I would point to, to Paul Krugman's column in the New York Times last Friday afternoon, basically said that, um, you know, I don't foresee a ton of trade wars, but I also don't foresee um, a lot of liberalization in, in the future. So I think we're sort of muddy through. Right. Well, good. This is a good segue. We, of course, we're just coming out of the G7 summit, not we, but the, but the leaders of the G7 countries are coming out of the G7 summit. And for those of us who don't follow trade very closely, myself, uh, I, I was a little confused and I'm, I'm curious to hear what you all think. Some folks uh, interpreted the communique from the G7 with respect to China in particular as too soft. Um, the Chinese dif disagreed. Uh, I, I'm curious what you all think. I'll go in reverse order. What, were you impressed or unimpressed with how the G7 dealt with the question of China in particular and is that a function of where your expectations were and what you expected to come out of it? Uh, or, or is it something else? I'll go to you first, Clark, on that question. Yeah, it was about what I expected. I, I mean, I think there's just generally a, a broad sort of emerging consensus that, that there, the Chinese economic model poses legitimate problems uh, for Western market-oriented democracy. So it, it was about what I expected. Um, you know, it was certainly softer in tone than what I hear a lot on Capitol Hill, which is sort of a rush toward hawkishness, um, sort of unbridled hawkishness. Um, but, but again, it, it was just a recognition, I think, of reality right now. But, and not particularly surprising, right? Because going into this, we knew that, that some of our major trading partners and some of the leading economies in the world uh, did not uh, share the views of, of some of the hawks on, on Capitol Hill, right? I mean, I think that's right. I think I think the signal was there from from statements made in various capitals around the world. Uh, Scott, how about you? What do you how, how do you interpret what came out of the G7 uh, summit? Not just the communique, but just sort of the vibe and, and how, how you read the tea leaves coming out of that meeting. Uh, I think the Western alliance is risen from the dead. Uh, we were really um, not talking to each other in the same language framework facts or anything. And uh, actually now we're, we're not necessarily all in harmony singing the exact same tune, but we are a lot closer, more closely aligned. And I know that there was discussion of, of a stronger statement on Taiwan or more specific on Chinese subsidies and this or that, but they got a lot. They got a lot. As an ex even there's only a couple places where China is explicitly identified. But otherwise, China is the shadow uh, target of almost every paragraph in that statement. You could, if you, you know, if you note, did a notation of it in bubbles, you could say how it played on Ch almost every aspect of our relationship with China. And I think that the administration, for all the slowness they're taking to do these reviews and come out with a so-called China policy, this is their China policy. It's allied policy, at least for this year. 
along with what they're trying to get through Congress. And so I give them, I, I you know, the, a few months ago, my Chinese friends were telling me, East is risen, the West is declining, you all are total chaos, look at what happened on January 6th, look at the pandemic. Now I think actually we're giving them reason to pause. We have a series of events and meetings and announcements and activities that show uh, China has not won, that this is a real contest. Uh, and that I, I think that's for the positive. As much as I'm worried about where we will eventually be on policies, right. uh, I think at the moment we, we, are, we are giving ourselves a chance. So while there's clearly not unanimity among the G7 leaders, there's, there's more agreement than disagreement as far as China goes, is from your perspective. Yes, yeah, certainly there's not full agreement on, on the exact tools, the specific language, et cetera. But we've, we, we're, we've done more than just say China's agree that China's a problem. We've gone much, we've started to affirm more about what we do want and specifically where we have challenges. And we're starting to take individual steps in places to cooperate that are littered throughout that G7 statement and what we saw with NATO and in the EU-China Business Summit today. Uh, Mary, what do you think? Well, I, I certainly agree uh, with Scott that um, a warming of relations, and in fact, actually making some progress, uh, for example, on the Airbus Boeing, and hopefully down the road on steel and aluminum, are vitally important. Um, we know that uh, the only way to really deal with China in the international system is by having a, a sort of a common uh, front, at least to some extent. Uh, it's been sort of, I, I think, a bit horrifying to see China try to isolate uh, various partners, such as Australia, uh, in retaliation for things that we take for granted, such as Australia's right to ask for an investigation uh, into the origins of COVID-19. So, um, it's nice to see a beginning uh, where we have the thaw. I think we have more than a thaw, but I'm still concerned about what lies ahead. Um, I think there is a lot of daylight between the US and the EU on various aspects of dealing with China. Um, these have surfaced before. Uh, they don't buy into the extreme rhetoric we hear on Capitol Hill. Uh, and um, I should say that it's also, you know, a, a, a more uh, surgical approach might also be approved by or, or supported by our Asian allies as well. Um, they're important to us and have to be brought into the conversation. Um, so we'll see. I think one of the things we can watch is to see whether we have cooperation on reviving the WTO. Sure. Uh, and whether we can bring that back in as a way to exert some disciplines on China, but also on the use of subsidies more broadly by other partners as well. So yeah. I think there's a lot of, that's just one example. I think there's other things we can watch. Scott mentioned NATO, uh, the business summit. So there's a lot of things that are gonna help us read the tea leaves. I was gonna come, come to WTO. So that's, I think that's a good segue. Uh, I, I'm curious to hear from, from Clark or Scott we know that the WTO, uh, especially from the, the dispute settlement uh, process, has really been sort of on life support. Um, do you agree with Mary that that the WTO has a chance of sort of getting its uh, getting getting back in the game, so to speak, and really being able to 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 bring some discipline um, again on the subsidy issue, and that it doesn't apply to China exclusively? Uh, where do you see uh, WTO fitting in, and again in the context of U.S.-China trade, but but global trade generally? Um. I'll, I'll give it a try. Um, go ahead, Scott. I, I have to tell you, of, of all the international organizations out there, I love the WTO most compared to all of them. <laughs> I've been impressed every time I've gone there from 15, 16 years ago. The people I've met, I'm impressed that it's so darn small compared to the size of the IMF and the World Bank, and they do so much. Anything that's small and punch, punches above its weight, I like. So they are... Um, really impressive and very clear principles, uh, amazingly collegial, even compared to Washington, the most collegial place on earth. And um, uh, a lot of what they, and, and they're very well-meaning and there's a lot of, of good substance. On the other hand, I think uh, they've tried, the, the world's problems have amassed so much, these three questions that I mentioned, they don't have the answers for all those questions. What are they, what, what can they, 
there's nothing there about workers, right? Or about economic distribution. They, they don't manage competition policy. There's so much, and people have put on, and even the things that they do like subsidies, those are incomplete rules. So there's a lot of, of, a lot of our complaints and worries are being put on the shoulders of the WTO that may not be able to manage it. I think we may, WTO, what I would like to see this year at a minimum is figure out how they can get to their ministerial in November and have some kind of constructive output from that. But I don't think we're necessarily gonna see a solving of the appellate body challenge and real progress on revising these agreements until the US makes further progress uh, with its uh, friends plurilaterally. I think that's gonna be a, a precursor to I think progress in, in Geneva. And you know, it's gonna be difficult. You've got China in the WTO, you got a lot of you know, 160 some members in India. It's really hard to get consensus out of Geneva, even in the midst of a huge challenge. So I think we ought not to overburden the WTO with very high expectations right now, but hope that we're on a path somewhere that gets us back to Geneva at some point. Clark, you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I, I would just say, you know, look, the. The WTO's uh, negotiating function has basically been stalled since the Doha round collapsed in 2008, 2009. Um, and, and, you know, maybe there's some progress at the ministerial. I, 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 I'm maybe somewhat hopeful that we can get an agreement on fishery subsidies. Um, you know, but, but if we are struggling to sort of address something as benign and small as fishery subsidies, um, I, I really do worry about uh, the WTO's ability to confront sort of broad state directed capitalism and the subsidy issue, the broader subsidy issues with respect to China's economic practices. Uh, but, 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 you know, I, I, I sort of share Scott's enthusiasm for the WTO. I, I think that the, the appellate body and the dispute settlement system works pretty well, um, but, but not well enough. It's not fast enough. There, there are some changes we can make on the margin uh, that I think would help. Um, but but overall, I think it works better than than the rhetoric around uh, Washington in particular would suggest. Right. Good. So let's um, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's uh, let's talk about John Cena, because, I mean, who doesn't want to talk about John Cena? Like, I don't have enough opportunities to talk about uh, wrestling stars turned, uh, you know, action heroes. Um, uh, I keep going back to, and, and look, it's, I'm not picking on him. Daryl Morey at the time with the Houston Rockets got into trouble for some things he said about Taiwan. Um, there was some recent reporting about Apple's uh, business relations with China and some of the compromises that it has had to make. But I, I'm a historian of the Cold War and I go back to thinking about how would Dwight Eisenhower have dealt with the Soviet Union if, um, if General Electric and General Motors um, had as much business in the Soviet Union in 1956 or 1957 as the United States and major companies and, and employees and, and shareholders have uh, in terms of economic ties to, to China today. This is a way more complicated thing. And, it's, and, and I, I, I talk about CNN, and I talk, you know, again, Disney and, and Mulan, and there are so many other cases. We're not talking about metal bending. We're not talking about Boeing. We're not talking about Caterpillar. We're talking about um, cultural exports and sort of self-censorship that we've seen um, uh, in many respects. And I'm just sort of curious, because it seems to me this is one of those aspects of U.S.-China trade that is that is most vexing, um, but also potentially really grounds for a good discussion. So I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on John Cena's difficulties. Uh, uh, I, I don't know whether it's a benefit to him or not that he actually speaks Mandarin so that he could make his apology in Mandarin, uh, or whether it would have been better if it was translated by a Chinese government official. Uh, but I'm just sort of curious what you all make of that of that incident. Um, uh, Clark, why don't I go to you first? Well, let me take a step back. Um, and I think, I think it's important um, to recognize exactly the differences, right, between 1956 and today. It, it, it's precisely the economic integration uh, between the West and China that makes this much more challenging uh, and complicated to, to, to manage, right? The, even if policymakers wanted to, in Washington, wanted to, to sort of push in one direction, um, for X, Y, and Z reasons, the business community uh, has a sizable seat at the table. Um, and, and so I think it's, it's just, just to take a step back, uh, it, it's worth acknowledging the significant differences that exist 
um, that, that make it, I think, more challenging today and, and more complex than it ever was during the Cold War, which seems ridiculous, uh, at, probably for a, a historian of the, of the Cold War to, to say that. But um, I'll, I'll leave it to keep it to, coming. To, I like uh, it <laughs> Scott, to, to answer the, the, the more concrete question. More concrete question about John Cena, Scott. I think I think uh, I think Clark will um, tee that up for you. Tajang Jong and Jangga Hun Hao. Chinese really pretty dang good. I mean, it's not like great. he beat. He's better than Mark Zuckerberg. I got to tell you honestly, and uh, who had who 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 went? I thought worse by having Xi Jinping, China governance on his the table there when she came to visit. I thought that was. That was bad. Um, honestly, I, I think uh, th those that operate in the art spaces expression, they're regulated from the Chinese side by the propaganda system. Those folks have basically no tolerance for a message that doesn't comport with the Chinese narrative. And uh, they have been given additional powers to police speech globally, right? So it didn't matter that the Houston Rockets GM was tweeting from his bed at midnight on in English to a non-Chinese audience because Twitter's banned in China. And it, it, it uh, didn't matter that websites are facing one, you know, et cetera. And uh, so these are very, very uh, assertive people. I think what, and, and I can understand because these are, are major, major dollar signs and that they haven't paid a price in Western public relations hit, you know, People, people are still going to watch Fast and Furious Nine in American theaters or whatever. Not, it doesn't matter what he did, but you know, I guess what I see is businesses um, that you you can be honest and and firm with the Chinese and still do business with them in many industries. And I'll just example this morning. I hosted an event, and I encourage folks to go look at it uh, with uh, Jurg Wutka who is the president of the European Chamber of Commerce in China and the chief representative for the uh, German company BASF, the chemical company. Jörg's been uh, in China for a few decades and he, he has no governor on his mouth. He says whatever he feels all the time and he writes it and he says it in public and private. There's very little distinction between the two environments. And BASF is one of the top five foreign investors in China. They have monster factories in Nanjing and other places. They get Chinese leaders to visit. And he sounds off on the Chinese all the time, all the time. And so I think there's a way, I, I think it's partly that C-suite fear of, 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 of the Chinese, but I think if they respect you, especially if you've got the goods, if you've got the tech, the know-how, uh, you, can, you can do that. So I, I wish that folks in Hollywood would realize that, uh, they they actually could could be more honest, and and not necessarily lose everything, but it requires them all to, to do it. It's I understand the, the 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 problem, right? And the collective action problem there. You you you've, you've, you've teed it up. So Mary, what what about you? How do, what do you think on on sort of this problem of self censorship and and how to how, how to interpret that? I mean, I appreciate very much what Scott is saying. Um, However, I think in the culture, you know, in the entertainment and culture sphere, it is, a, it is the, the pressure is deeper. Um, I think that we have to say, well, how, how much of a concern is this for us? I think it becomes a concern when we feel that Chinese, po Chinese economic power can be used to alter our policies. Um, so for example, I go back to the Australia example, uh, would we pull punches and asking for a fair hearing on uh, what ultimately is something that the world needs to know, how did, how did uh, COVID-19 uh, you know, jump species get here uh, and really twist the arm of Australia, try to hurt them economically uh, for that uh, speech. So I, I, I think that you know, it, it seems almost a little trivial to talk about this little Fast and Furious case, but it has a deeper, darker side. And um, again, it's easy to exploit uh, daylight between the allies. I think going back to what Scott said about the warming of the relations, I think it's going to help. 
I would have liked to see a, a more rallying around Australia uh, from the public, I guess. Uh, but um, I, I think that the, that there is a there is a warning here that we need to take seriously. Great. Um, so I understand that it's hard to sort of regulate this problem, and that and that's part of why it's so vexing, and 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 why I teed it up, and I and and. Obviously, there are some elements of this that are sort of, sort of amusing, but there's a deeper, darker issue here. Um, in the interest of just sort of grouping together some some other sort of regulatory, get get down in the weeds a little bit, and maybe a lightning round. You, you three can pick which ones you're you'd most want to focus on. You know, there are three areas of of sort of particulars in terms of managing U.S. China trade um, that have come up recently and, and in, in some respects more, more recently in the context of COVID. One has to do with supply chain security and resilience, um, not merely onshoring, uh, but, but, but something more complicated than that. Uh, the second has to do with export controls, um, sort of we have a set of regulations there, uh, obviously, and then also uh, restrictions on investment here in the United States and some new regulations put into place over the last few years with respect to that. Um, in those three areas, I'm just curious if any uh, each of you would comment: um, is is more government regulation along these lines likely? Um, uh, what effect is that likely to have? Um, are we barking up the wrong tree? Uh, I'll I'll kick it to you first, Mary. Uh, again, you could pick one of those three things that I put on the table, or something completely different. But just in the broad uh, uh, sense of sort of re regulation, U.S. government regulations as it pertains to U.S. China trade. Well, I think we're going to see regulation and spending. If you look at the supply chain, the 100-day supply chain review, uh, it's pretty clear that the government's going to have to have skin in the game if they want to achieve the uh, objectives. And I, I say that also thinking that that document seems like it was written by three separate groups. Uh, you know, one who <laughs> really wants to reshore, uh, wants the good union job, so everything needs to be made here. You could actually feel the hostility to trade there, the belief that uh, any time a job is created overseas with U.S. foreign investment doesn't say it, but it, you know, that's a job that could have been created at home. That's the, that's the thought there. Then you have, you know, probably the Treasury input uh, arguing that we need to work with partners and we need to keep uh, trade and investment flowing. Um, and then, of course, the national security concerns. So I think we're, we're as a society, we're going to have to sort these out because it, we're not going to be able to uh, make progress in terms of trade liberalization with any of our partners, uh, while also making sure that nobody that pays a lower wage than U.S. Uh, wages will actually be able to export anything to the United States. So, um, and will that our our supply chains are 100% secure? So, you know, we have to have fake trade-offs. I think I, I the, the disappointment for me was an absence of awareness of trade-offs. That's maybe will come down the road. Um, so uh, a little fear that everybody's favorite hobby horse is going to get put in under the, the uh, security and resilience uh, heading. On restrictions on investment, uh, we did an event with CSIS last week with Simon Evenet from the Global Trade Alert. Uh, and they are um, counting up the number of restrictions on inward foreign investment and finding that it's not just to developed countries, it's also developing countries. Uh, and this is a problem, I think, not only for those of us who think foreign investment by and large is, is a good thing into our economy, um, but also because we know that there's still a need for technology transfer uh, and investment into developing countries um, who are gonna come out of this pandemic more slowly than, than the rich countries and are going to uh, continue to need inflows. So, um, you know, it, it would be helpful to have a more helpful rhetoric. Um, my own view is that um, the U.S. really needs to get its mojo back in some ways, that instead of continually playing defense, we need to play off, you know, uh, we need to feel that we are um, able to compete and uh, it's unfair to put on trade all the domestic issues, the inequality issues, the failure to large segments of the population to feel that they're they're sharing in this in in the gains. And um, I think that other parts of the Biden agenda could go a long way. We'll see if they can get enacted. 
Um, certainly uh, changes in labor market policies. Uh, we know, we've known for a long time that we needed to invest in infrastructure, uh, government inc increases in government support for R&D, uh, something that Scott's worked a lot on for China. Uh, these are things that I think would help uh, to increase in some sense the generosity of the American spirit when it comes to these other factors. Scott, thoughts on, uh, on current regulation or future regulation as it pertains to U.S. China trade? Yeah. Um, we're never going to go full free market on any of this stuff. We're definitely going to have plenty of regulation. Uh, but what I do think is, is constructive is, I mean, we've been having the, the dominant conversation we've been having in Washington the last uh, two plus years has been whether or not we should decouple from China. That's the basic framework. And the answers have been, yes, we should, or we should in some places and not in others. Uh, I think we are gradually getting beyond that conversation to say, well, we should decouple from Xinjiang, but not all of China, right? Uh, and instead, what we need to do is build systems to mitigate these risks that we have from our overall relationship with China. And if we can't mitigate, well, then in those places, we will have severe restrictions. But we are finding that there's, we, it's going to be a complex answer. In the case of supply chains, Different sectors have different exposures. It's um, you know maybe overinvested in China. China's got leverage in those markets for prices or supplies. In some, it's not so bad. And in some places, we need to diversify supply sources of supply. In some places, we need just greater emergent. We need more emergency preparedness. We couldn't have dealt with no no market no distribution of production would have been get, made us prepared in April of last year for the things that we needed, right? So there's a variety of different solutions on export controls. I think what's what we're seeing different uh, is, is that instead of, and this maybe is also, I think this applies to investment as well. Instead of seeing attacks on individual Chinese companies and institutions, as we saw in the Trump administration, what we're seeing is a strategy that articulates principles that aren't China specific, but more general, tries to create a process for clarity and then a process for alignment with allies. And so if you look at the executive order that was uh, related to WeChat and TikTok, so they said, you know, instead of just trying to disband these two apps or doing business with these entities, instead they came up with principles to deal with connected software apps from uh, opponents, right? And a process by which they're gonna over the next few months come up with those principles and clarity. What we were gonna do was ban them or we were gonna come up with rules which are like, okay, we're gonna need to sell, WeChat is, Tencent is gonna have to create a new company, Cisco and Walmart are gonna invest in it. They're gonna share their data uh, or localize it. We're gonna, we were gonna come up with a Chinese solution, right? Of corporate control. Try implementing that. <laughs> so instead, I think, although it's not going to be free market at all, it'll. I I think the boundaries will be at least clear and more predictable. And my guess is that global businesses prize predictability quite a bit, and and that will make things maybe feel a little bit better, even if the line is drawn not where businesses want it to be drawn. Clark, do you do you disagree, or or to what and to what extent? How, where, where, how would you dif, dis, uh, differ, or or do you mostly agree with what Scott and Mary have said? Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to agree. I think uh, just to sort of run down the the list on on supply chain resiliency, I think the the sort of big thing going on right now, the Endless Frontiers Act or the U.S. Competitiveness and Innovation Act. I think we're going to see a bunch of domestic subsidies. Um, I'm I'm somewhat skeptical of that. I put out a piece about a week ago saying that it was a missed opportunity to re-engage on trade and immigration. I think those tools are way more important than Washington trying to pick domestic winners and losers. Um, on export control, I, th I think that that's the tool that will be used going forward. I think the Huawei uh, example and the Clean Networks Initiative was, was more successful than the tariffs. Um, you know, I, I think that that's just sort of where uh, the wind is blowing. I would hope that we can put in some safeguards so that we're not just depriving U.S. firms of 
of sales abroad. Um, but, but on investment restrictions, obviously in 2018, Congress passed FIRMA, uh, trying to sort of uh, bolster our ability to monitor, monitor inward uh, investment. But there's also a lot of discussion right now about monitoring external or outward investment, um, particularly with respect to China. I know Senator Cornyn and Senator Sullivan have talked about that. Um, and, and I think that that's probably an area that's going to be ripe to try to, again, just have an understanding of what, you know, private equity firms are in the United States are doing in China. And it, are they sort of bolstering, um, you know, potentially troublesome industries over in China? So I, I think that to sort of run down those, I, I think that's sort of the broad landscape. Um, to follow up on, is, is it too soon to say what impact firma has had on on foreign investment or 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 can you make a, a determination uh clark on on sort of how would you how would you judge you know we know what the intention was was to was to limit actual harmful investment in that in, in sensitive technologies and and national security relevant things um do you think it's had that effect do we not know yet is it too soon what do you think i think it's probably a little too soon i think also in light of the shock that to the system that was 2020, you know, I, I think that right. um, it, it's hard to sort of separate out what what's actually happening in, in investment right. right now. Right. Yeah. Good point. Um, we we've danced around this. Actually, I'm going to come back to this. I'm going to come back to this the end. Um, one issue that has has been sort of lurking over the last uh, five years is uh, the Trans Pacific Partnership. Um, on the one hand, uh, you, we, we know that the Trump administration uh, fairly ostentatiously withdrew the United States from, from TPP. Um, uh, candidate Hillary Clinton had signaled that she also would not have followed through. Whether or not that's the case, we will never know. Um, uh, Japan in the lead and others uh, moved forward with the CTPPP. Uh, yeah, you know what I mean. Uh, easy for me to say. Um, how important do you all think it is for the United States to try to rejoin the TPP, or is it just too heavy a lift right now to actually get a multilateral trade agreement uh, through Congress? Uh, is this the kind of thing we know, and I don't want to steal the thunder because we're going to talk about infrastructure, industrial policy tomorrow in the panel, and I can't wait to watch that discussion. So we know the other thing that there's bipartisan agreement on uh, in some respects, is on is on TPP. You see both Republicans and Democrats talking about this, but yet it still seems like a heavy lift. Or, or do you th do you think it's really important for the Biden administration to to push on that in the interest of of strengthening the United States hand um, in trade policy with China in particular, and in conjunction with our allies and partners? Um, who wants to take that one? Scott, go ahead. Okay. Um, wow. My, I, you know, TPP started as this small idea from a, a cool country in the South Pacific, um, New Zealand, and uh, originally then spread a little bit, caught some fire. I, I, I really think it was uh, a genius idea. And uh, if you've, especially, you know, once, as, as Clark mentioned, the door around coming to a halt, you gotta have some other avenue to try and uh, multi, get multilateral rules. Uh, and, and TPP seemed like, a, a place to work and then you would eventually multilateralize things for you get back to Geneva. I still think uh, it's it's really helpful and, and could be part of that. And I'm glad that the Japanese showed leadership in keeping TPP alive and, and getting it in, implemented. It's way more important than RCEP. Um, I, I don't think the time is ripe for the US to, to start to uh, signal a plan to return. I, I, I think they need to focus on infrastructure, uh, these maybe more spending than Clark wants on some industries, other things which will be politically popular at home to get Biden's positives up, to make people less scared about the potential downside consequences of, of trade liberalization or other things, even if it's not real trade, if it's on, on other things like data and foreign you know, investment and state-owned enterprises and, and things like that. So to me, uh, I think it's super important. We ought to figure out how to, I mean, we'll need to change the name, of course. So we should have a con, you guys can have a contest, <laughs> contest. about what the name should be. Uh, 
but I would say in two years, let that start to be a topic. But let's, I think politically, you just, you just can't go from where we were dead stop to, to where, where we wanna be in, in one jump. So as much as I think it is the substantively right solution uh, to potentially for lots of things, uh, I just don't see it making sense to, to go to do go too soon. Mary or Clark, you want to add to that? I do have one question in the chat. So, but if you, if you wanted to add, please go ahead. I'm just going to say that Scott is just agreeing uh, with me <laughs> uh, that the U S needs to, you know, feel like it's, you know, it's, 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 it's fuller. It's, for it to be more generous. And, and that's what I meant by that statement. Right now, I think the pop, you know, US pop, it's like, what about us? What about us? There's no, and without this view that engaging with others actually has benefits for the majority of the people, you're not going to see uh, any kind of, it's like political suicide. So on the politics side, if you look at what uh, Catherine Tai was, you know, most famous for, the, you know, rapid response mechanism, I mean, there's just no other case where we're going to get a rapid response mechanism. It's not going to be part of TPP. Um, so uh, if that's what it's going to take to get um, a bipartisan support for uh, TPP. It's just not going to happen. So that's politically. Economically and from a, you know, economic statecraft point of view, I think it makes a tremendous amount of sense. Uh, you know, Scott's right, RCEP is not TPP, but I still think that RCEP is potentially quite important in terms of providing a platform for the RCEP countries, very broad coverage um, throughout Asia and because of the rules of origin within the RCEP, which will help to create a separate Asian um, you know, production network. And uh, eventually the US could be built more and more out of that network. Uh, TPP would be a way to, for us to come in and make uh, markets for what we do best, which is higher tech, higher quality goods. So I think it's a real disadvantage for us to be out economically, politically, totally agree with Scott. It's a non-starter, at least in the foreseeable future. Clark, do you want to add anything? We can move on. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a veteran of that fight. I have the scars to, to prove that. Um, yeah, you know, it, the, the case, the strategic case for TPP grows stronger every single day. Um, but the politics, to, to be frank, just suck, right? Um, <laughs> I think there, there's sort of a gun shyness uh, among Democrats, uh, particularly in the White House. Uh, they, they, I think that a lot of the folks that are staffing in the White House uh, worked pretty high up in, in Hillary Clinton's campaign, and they would point to sort of this as, as one of a number of uh, policy areas where she was sort of taking arrows and a narrative was painted. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, the politics are bad, but but the economics and the, the strategic benefits are, are crystal clear. And, and I, I, I hope that within the next couple of years, we can get back in, um, but I, I don't foresee it in the, in the near term. Go ahead, Scott. I just... You know, I, I I wasn't in the in the line of fire, so but I was here in 2014, 15, 16 working, and I was just shocked because as I watched the agreement being negotiated and come into force, I thought this is progress on labor, this is progress on environment, this is progress on SOEs, and it was just nitpicked to death, and the opponents were much more assertive in framing what TPP was. And yes, there are ways, definite ways it could be improved and loopholes closed. And the fact that G Vietnam could join pretty easily and there's a bunch of you know side letters and things like that. There's, but I just thought it got too easily pinned as uh, inconsistent with the type of values that Obama's coalition was supposed to be defending and the administration didn't do enough uh, retail sales of it. And so now maybe it's too late to do that. I, but I agree. It just, so to me, it's a, it's a story about a political fight as opposed to the substance of, of what's in it. Right. All right. We do have a good question in the, in the chat that I wanted to ask to, to wrap things up here. It has to do with uh, intellectual property protection and, and how China deals with that or does it, as the case may be, also as it relates to forced technology transfer. How, how do you three approach this within the broader context of U.S.-China uh, trade relations? How important should it be in the, in the discussions, the negotiations? 
Uh, what, what points of leverage does the United States have to make progress on this, to, to uh, provide credit protections, or, or is this something that, that needs to be handled in a different way uh, than, a, than in a bilateral approach? Um, who wants to take that one first? Uh, Clark, Mary is pointing at you uh, from my picture. So, so Clark, uh, you, you, get the, you get to answer that question. Uh, intellectual yeah, um, property and forced technology transfer. Yeah, I mean, those, those form the sort of core basis of the 301 indictment of Chinese trade policy practices that the, the Trump administration levied. Um, look, I, I think that, uh, you know, China made a, some commitments on IP in particular and in, in, in the so-called phase one agreement. But again, I think that it's probably too early to know. But, but I, I think that that's right. I think that American IP creators have legitimate concerns there. Um, I just don't know the tools that you use to, to sort of address those. Right, right. Scott or Mary, you want to add to that? Of course, one of the tools, I, I could say, one of the tools is that they walk. Right? One of the tools mm -hmm. is the companies conclude that the risks, that their intellectual property is their, is their business, right, is their future, and they walk. Um, and again, those, those instances aren't, aren't zero, Right there, are, there have been such cases, um, but I think it's fair to say that they're they're rare. You know, I remember um, Bill Gates uh, was giving a talk at the University of Washington in 1998 or 1999, and someone in the audience asked him about IP theft, and he uh, it was with Warren Buffett, and uh, his answer uh, was uh, overly honest. He said, if they're gonna steal software, I hope they steal mine, get addicted to it, and then eventually we'll figure out how they pay. <laughs> I, that was Microsoft's strategy. It turned out not to work too well. The, they make far less money in China than they should given the size of the market. Right. Uh, they probably sell more Xboxes or other hardware stuff than, than, than software sales, even by, by trying to bundle and negotiate pre-install or whatever you, you want to call it. Uh, and, and they've had to move into a bunch of other things. I think it's really, really difficult. On the one hand, the Chinese know as an innovative society, you have to have innovators who are able to benefit from the innovations that they create. Uh, and so you see improvements in Chinese IP law, even enforcement. Uh, at the same time, they know that they're in a, from their perspective, they are in a knockdown competitive fight for the commanding heights of economies. And so they want to be the ones to hold uh, the, the brass ring and, and get the rents uh, and the leverage that comes from, from that. They, I remember going back 20 plus years, they just, they thought Qualcomm was the ideal model. If, if we controlled something like CDMA technology, then everyone would be you know, paying us and praying to us and being nice to us. And they've never come up with their own really good all, all version of that. So I, I, that we're gonna have to fight that. The other thing though, the, the fight with China, which I think is really important, leads us to forget that another part, an important part of technology is the diffusion of technology, the access to technology. Microsoft makes a lot of money off of its products, but 99% of the value from Microsoft products are made by the users of the Microsoft products. And we need that as part of promoting economic development, our own economic resilience and improvements. We need to find ways to both protect technology, even from uh, thievery that the Chinese launch, but we also need to figure out how to get technology and knowledge in as far as wide places as possible in our country and in other countries. Well, I. I think that's a great place to wrap up. And I've, I've just been a real privilege to talk to the three of you. Uh, and thanks again to, um, to you for joining us. I'm gonna kick it back over to Jared Labor. Jared, take it away. Thanks. Yeah, thank you everybody. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Clark. Thank you, Mary. Uh, I put every single speaker's uh, Twitter uh, handle in the chat. Be sure to follow them on social if you are uh, among those unfortunate, fortunate to be on Twitter. Uh, uh, they are uh, well worth a follow for their commentary on these issues and others. Um, again, thank you to Chris, Scott, Clark, and Mary. Uh, it was a wonderful conversation. Thank you.